welcome. We're going to wait another minute till we get started. We have opening up our doors to our virtual classroom this morning. Welcome here. We hope that if you're joining us from the West Coast this morning, you're just waking up and maybe you're watching us from, from your bed or your couch. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Helen, does it look like we have people here in the room? Helen's on mute. <laughs> Not many. It looks like they're slow to enter. They 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 don't come on quite as quickly as um, okay. In the webinar. Let's, let's wait another minute till we get more people in the room. We've got uh, good morning, Jen Heater from California. Just. Uh, texted us. Good morning. Good to see you here, Jen. Anybody else want to text into the chat? You can. Good morning, Nicole. Nicole, where are you from? Wisconsin. Diane Fox from Philadelphia. Hello, Diane. Hello, Renetta Stokes. Everyone's typing in. All right, this is coming so fast. I can't read them all. Virginia, we've got Ellen from Virginia. We've got, well, it just says Brasco D from New Jersey, Helen. Uh, we've got Kristen from Sioux Falls, New York City, Shelly from Ohio. Okay, looks like we got a lot of people coming in, so I think we should go ahead and get started. We wanna maintain, uh, we wanna respect your time this morning and make sure that you have a chance to do something else with your day today. Uh, I wanna first start by saying I'm Shirley Kessel. I'm the Executive Director of Miles for Migraine and I also have chronic migraine. Thank you for coming this morning and we're gonna cover what we hope will uh, give you new information about a new protocol for visiting your healthcare provider, the telemedicine visit. We're hearing from the migraine and other headache diseases community that telemedicine has many advantages for people who have difficulty making the effort to get to their doctor in person. Just getting there sometimes can be a trigger for people with migraine. Uh, so you'll hear about those in just a minute, but first I wanna take a moment to go over just some announcements and some housekeeping notes. Uh, you should put your screen into um, presentation view. And if you have any trouble with anything, there's really nothing you need to do. You're muted. So you'll get an opportunity to ask questions in the chat box as they come up. We'll be taking questions at the end of the presentations from both of our presenters this morning. Uh, so if you are here this morning, hopefully you know, and if you don't know, it's really vital that we all know as part of this community that there's actually something that we can do to help find a cure for migraine. And that's something is to advocate. So advocacy comes in many forms and just by showing up here today is actually an act of advocacy. So thank you for being here. If you wanna take advocacy a step further, take a look at our website and join one of our walk run just relax events because not only will you be able to be part of our year end digital photo album, but you're also taking a vital step to join a movement of other advocates just like you who are making some big noise about migraine and other headache diseases. We really need to educate the public. I can't stress this enough. The public does not really understand the, the plight that we are enduring um, having migraine and other headache diseases. We need them to understand that in fact, migraine is a severe neurologic disease and this can cause severe disability and robs us of the precious moments of our lives. In addition to walk runs, we also offer a migraine support community group. It's a daily support group for adults. And we also have one for teens that meets on Wednesdays. We also offer educational events from world leaders in migraine and headache medicine who do research and work in the top, top academic institutions in the country. 
And finally, we are excited to announce a new series beginning in August called Mindfulness for Migraine, where you'll have the opportunity to experience mindfulness-based therapies to reduce stress, increase resilience, and relaxation. Following this program today, you'll receive two emails. The first is a survey to let us know how we did. So please take a moment to answer this and you will be placed into a drawing to receive either one of our face masks, our vanity face mask, or a special edition t-shirt, which has our brain logo, which we all know you want because it's fun. Uh, so that's the first survey. And then the second email will be a top 10 checklist digital asset covering what our patient expert, who you'll hear from this morning, Dr. Anika Saleem, uh, she'll be covering. So there's really no need for you to take notes. If you just want to relax and listen, we'll be sending you that as a follow up. And finally, I'd like to take a moment now to thank our very generous sponsor for this program that's being sponsored by Allergan, which is an AbbVie com company. Without their sponsorship, we could not bring this vital program to our community. So please take a look at our website for detailed information on products they make for migraine prevention and also for attacks. There will also be, uh, you'll, you'll also find product sample and the savings card program there on our website in our exhibit hall uh, where you went to register for this event. We need to take advantage of these programs because we all need to save money in today's economy. So let's get started with our first speaker, who is Dr. Andrew Blumenfeld. And he grew up in South Africa and he graduated from St. Andrew's College in South Africa with a distinction in mathematics. He completed his neurology training at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. The highlights of his practice include that he was chief of neurology service at Kaiser and he is currently director of the Headache Center of Southern California, located in San Diego, California. Dr. Blumenfeld is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology and a fellow of the American Headache Society. He is the founding chair of the American Headache Society section of Interventional Procedures for Headache Management. He has over 70 peer-reviewed publications. One of his manuscripts has been voted as best journal article by the Journal of Headache. So welcome here this morning with us, doctor. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Shirley. So let's just start by uh, talking about, you know, what, what is telemedicine and what are some of the limitations and benefits of telemedicine? Yes, well, telemedicine is probably one of the, the best things that's come out of this COVID era because it's allowed us to see patients without them feeling at risk for exposure to becoming infected. And it does bring a lot of convenience to patients because you don't have to worry about getting dressed and driving to the doctor and finding parking and worrying about childcare. So there's a lot of convenience that goes into these visits um, that have, have been a big improvement from what we've had before. Um, so we really are enjoying the the opportunity to do telemedicine. Um, there are limitations because we can't examine the patient to the same extent. And that examination can be very important with a new patient. So we're doing telemedicine on new patients as well as follow-ups. And the follow-ups are much easier to feel comfortable with because you've examined the patient and you have a good idea you know, what you're dealing with. But for example, on a new patient, we need to look in the eyes and we need to look at the, the back of the eye, at the optic nerve and, and make sure that it's not swollen because you can get you know, different types of headache disorders where that's swollen and, and not mimic migraine and you don't want to miss that. And uh, so that's the risk is that you don't have full access to a detailed exam. Now, typically, what most officers are doing is that they'll have the patient go through a consent process when, when you start the visit. And the consent process basically says that the patient understands that this is not as good as an in-person visit and certain medical conditions could be missed. And, and you proceed under that heading 
with, with that understanding. Um, but having said that, you know, that's the negative. The positive is that we're able to continue seeing patients during a very difficult time. Absolutely. And so you mentioned that there are some downsides to telemedicine and specific, specifically examining the patient. And when you and I were speaking earlier about this, uh, you had explained to me, uh, you know, how, well, my question is how effective is it for treating headache disorders? And we were talking about why physicians sometimes ask closed-ended questions to patients. So, so how effective is it? Well, I'm finding that the televisit is going exceptionally well. Um, for me, I think everything in terms of the interview is as good as it is in person. Um, we do have to ask closed-end questions because insurance companies require very specific data points. So a good example would be that if you were trying to get an approval, let's say for Botox as a treatment option. So insurance companies, if I write in the patient's chart that you only have 14 headache days a month, there's no way I'll get it approved. But if I put the magic number of 15 headache days a month, it will be approved. So I have to get that 15 into the record. And then insurance companies will look at patients in terms of how they respond to treatment. And if you don't show a reduction in headache days when I'm treating you by a certain number, they'll cancel the approval. So I'm asking closed-ended questions because I know what the insurance companies are looking for. Now, what I often find with patients is, I'll say, how many days in the month do you have headache? And patients, despite having headache um, nearly every day will often only report their worst headaches. They'll say, I only have eight headache days a month. The follow-up question is, how many days in the month don't you have headache? How many days in the month are you completely free of headache? And we like to refer to those as crystal clear days. How many days in the month are you crystal clear? Not even a little bit of headache. And, and then you'll hear, well, no, I have headache every day. And I'm, you know, those are not the bad ones. I'm talk, I wanted to talk to you about the eight, but I need the every day. Mm -hmm. Because when I put down 30 out of 30, now that becomes the baseline that you have to improve from. So when the insurance company says, well, you have to improve by seven headache days after you've had Botox two times, well, I can move you from 30 to 23. And that's a lot easier than moving from 15 to eight, uh, from, from eight to one, you know. So um, we need to capture that information um, so that I can meet the requirement. So the, the traditional way of doing a, um, a consultation is to have open-ended questions where you would say, tell me how migraine impacts your life. And, and you would then be able to give me all those details. And, and a lot of times, you would get most of the information with an open-ended question. But it's important that patients understand that we do need these closed-ended um, points to make sure we can get all the treatment options that are available for them. Right, and that makes, that makes a lot of sense, and which is why patients should be keeping a headache diary, right? What do you, can you talk a little bit about why you <coughs> patients to Absolutely. keep a headache diary? But it's very important to keep a headache diary. And in this diary, you need to track all your headaches. So it's not a matter of saying, you know, I'll just put down the bad days. What you want to capture is, a, is the headache free days. So every day you need to make a notation, whether you have um, a mild headache, a moderate, severe, or no headache. And that will give us the best information. Some insurance companies even ask to see the diaries in order to, to show improvement and to document things. We typically capture what's called a MIDAS uh, questionnaire at the start of each visit. And the MIDAS asks you to remember how many days of headache you had over the last three months. And that's gonna be difficult if you haven't kept a diary, unless you're having headache every day. Um, that, that answer won't be accurate. And then it asks how many activities you missed, you know, during those three months, either at work or socially. 
and you need to capture that. Um, so the important things to put down so you can complete a, a Midas form would be the, the frequency of your headache and whether or not you're missing activities. The other useful feature is to look at the acute treatments that have been used. So if you can document those, it'll tell us how many days in a month you're taking acute medicines. Um, and that's also useful information. Okay, now let's, let's transition here over to procedures. So what if a patient does need an in-office procedure? What protocol are you using in your office for procedures? Well, certainly the type of visit that a patient still needs to come into the clinic for during this era is going to be any procedure. The main headache-related procedures are going to be Botox injections, nerve block injections, trigger point injections, sphenopalatine ganglion uh, blocks. Those are the main things that are typically done and, and considered as procedural-based. And obviously, you'll need a visit for that. When we do our Botox injections at the present time, it's a little bit different from what we did prior to COVID. So now you are booked for a visit, but the schedule is much more broadly open so that there is no one else in the area where you are sitting, like in the waiting room. And certainly when you come into the exam room, it'll just be you, no caregiver, um, to, to limit the number of people in the space. And the patients will have their temperature taken and will wear a mask and the provider will be wearing a mask and gloves. And we do the procedure with you sitting and we start at the back. So we start with your shoulders and your neck and the back of the head. And then we turn the head to the sides to do the, the temple area. And then we're only coming to the front um, to do the forehead. So there's very limited time that we're close up and face to face. Um, and this has worked exceptionally well. Um, I haven't had any issues with any you know, patients being uncomfortable with doing the procedure like this. And I think it's reassuring that there's such a limited amount of time that we're face to face and everyone is masked um, and, and following good procedure. Um, and the visits are short so that if there's additional follow-up that needs to happen, that can be done with a televisit. So everything is done on a very um, abbreviated schedule to limit the amount of time that we're face to face. If we are seeing a new patient in the clinic and the new patient wants to try a Botox, for example, there is a sample program where, and this is applicable for all physicians, they get a free drug from Allergan and we can inject you at that visit so that you don't have to come back another time and be re-exposed. So there, this is a nice uh, opportunity. I mean, you've gone to the trouble of coming out, coming to the visit, so let's get the procedure done and not re-expose you another day or another week um, by waiting for treatment. So once you give that sample, you then have the 12 weeks to do your prior authorization and get the next treatment lined up. Okay. And what if a patient though doesn't want to come into the office for fear of COVID exposure? What should they be asking their healthcare provider if they want to switch from procedure-based treatment to a home treatment? Right, well, it's very important that everybody remain on preventative treatments at the moment because you don't want to have breakthrough attacks where you're going to end up in urgent care or the emergency room because that's probably your highest risk area. So if you're unable to come in and complete your procedures, then alternative preventative treatments should be thought about. The problem with that is that let's say you are responding to Botox and you are anxious and you don't want to come in for the procedure. There isn't a guarantee that you're going to respond to another preventative treatment in the same way. You, you, know, you could switch to a monoclonal antibody, but Botox response doesn't mean that you will that later be a, a responder to a CGRP drug. 
Um, so there, there's no way of predicting how you're going to do. The problem that I'm finding with this is that when patients do switch like that, some insurance companies will then cancel their Botox approval. So then I'm left with a patient who is not doing well on the monoclonal antibody and no longer has a Botox approval. So it gets to be a very anxiety producing situation. So I don't want anybody to go without prevention. We would definitely encourage switching to a monoclonal antibody as probably the, the next best option if it hadn't been tried. But it's a problem in terms of some of the insurance companies. Now recently, Aetna and United are covering dual therapy with Botox and CGRP monoclonal antibodies. So in the situation of those two insurance companies, we can use both modalities. And that, so that would be a good option at the present time. Okay, good. And what about uh, if patients, um, if they if they decide to then do the, the televisit, how secure is the visit? What about their privacy? Well, the visit is done in, in a medical office, but it is a little bit different. It's not an exam room. Typically, the doctor is going to be calling from his office. Now, for example, in my office, I share that with another physician. So there may be times where that other physician is in the room. Now, we we try and respect each other's privacy and I'll go and sit in an exam room while, while she's on the phone and vice versa, so that uh, we, we're not overlapping. But it is possible that a nurse or another doctor would walk into the room during the visit. So there, there is that possibility that other people might hear the interaction. Um, so it's a little less uh, private than if it's uh, just you and the patient in, in an exam room. Um, but that is part of that consent procedure that we, we give. You know, I also don't know who is listening on the other end, how many, you know, because they can be off screen and I can't tell how many people are in the room um, as I'm interacting with the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and, and I guess one of the advantages is that right now, who's paying for telemedicine? How's it paid for? And I think my understanding is that it's being reimbursed by insurers. Yes. So this is a, a big change. You know, prior to COVID, this form of interacting with patients was not paid for. And as a result, it was used in a very limited basis for patients who are in distant rural, rural areas and didn't have access to healthcare providers. But um, since the beginning of March, this has all changed, you know, with government's uh, uh, direction pointing Medicare to start uh, having codes for telemedicine. And the, the big insurance companies, the five big insurance companies like Blue Cross, Aetna, United, Cigna, um, these have all adopted uh, policies that allow telemedicine to be reimbursed. Some states have mandates that have required the insurers to cover this. Um, now, I can't guarantee that in every state that every insurance company is doing it, but the big five are, and Medicare definitely is. So now these uh, visits are reimbursed exactly the same as if it was an in-person visit. Um, the requirement though is that there be a video that you're able to see the patient. So it's not just a phone visit. Um, there needs to be some visualization um, of the patient. Um, and we do try and do an examination over the phone using the video. Um, so there is a brief part of the visit that is an examination. For example, I can see eye movements by having you bring the the, the phone close to your eyes and looking left and right and up and down. I can see facial movements, I can see neck movements, and I can see how your arms and legs move and there, there's certain tests that I can do on the phone um, that the American Academy of Neurology has been developing. So there's this whole new technique of interacting with the patient over the phone. 
uh, but you can't look in the eyes. You can't see the fundi very well. You can't do the reflexes. You know, you can do some coordination testing, uh, but you can't check the sensation. So it's limited in terms of, of the examination. Uh, but in terms of the interaction, um, everything there is exactly the same. Um, and so I agree that these visits should be uh, reimbursed the way that, uh, that has been set in place now. Um, the concern is that it won't last, that when, when mm -hmm. COVID ends, they will cancel these approvals. And I think that will be a, a, a negative. I think that this has been a, a big improvement and it's, it's a very good way for patients to communicate with their physician. Um, you save so much time. You know, if you think about getting dressed and driving and parking and driving back home, um, that's a waste of time and you don't need to do that. So uh, I think the advocacy groups are going to need to play a very active role in maintaining this type of access. Well, you bring a very good, important point, which is one of my next questions for you was going to be, you know, how can we? And I actually happen to know the answer to this to myself already. So I'm just going to throw the answer and what should we do? This is really important for the community to understand. I, for one, am in favor of telemedicine. I've been using it myself and it's been fabulous for myself for working with my headache doctor. But right now there is a fight, a policy fight happening in DC and state capitals as policymakers are considering if the expanded access to health, telehealth that is happening during this pandemic will continue afterwards. So patient, advocate, patient advocacy organizations uh, such as ours and other ones in this, this migraine and headache space are co-signing letters of support right now and participating in this debate. So we're in the early stages of figuring out how we can best empower individual patient voices to be heard in this process, advocating for continued telehealth access. So since you have registered for this event today, you will receive an update from us so that when they are ready to activate patient voices, you will receive this information via email and we will be letting you know how we would like for you to then take it to the next step. Uh, the initial flexibilities tied to telemed reimbursement race and flexibilities were tied to the 90 day emergency declaration. This is the history behind this. Uh, while that period is expiring July 24th, which is coming up, we expect CMS to issue guidance in the very near future about an extension. Commercial payers would likely follow what CMS does. So we're monitoring this closely. So that's why we hope that when you get the email from us, the second one, we'll actually be sending you a link to a survey that we'd like you to complete that's being put out by the uh, Alliance for Patient Access. Uh, so let's just jump, uh, one more question here is, what about vitals? Are, do you ask your patients to get their vitals ahead of time? And what do you think that's a good idea? <clears throat> we haven't made that a requirement. I recently had a televisit with my doctor and they required it. Um, you know, I think it's a nice to have, but I wouldn't um, make that a restriction and say, well, you know, if we don't have this, we're not going to be able to proceed. I think that um, the, the most important aspects for me are the interaction with the patient and I can learn a lot from that. Um, and so I wouldn't say you have to go out and get a, a blood pressure cuff uh, in order to do this. Okay, that's fair. But you could always weigh yourself. And if you have a scale at home, right, you could yeah. do, I'm sure your healthcare provider would appreciate that. Okay, so we're actually, uh, thank you. We're gonna take some questions from the audience. We do have some uh, pre-survey questions that I have here. We're going to do some Q&A at the, uh, towards the end and at around 20 minutes after the hour. And I want to make a shift right now as we bring on our next presenter. And her name is Dr. Anika Salim. And she is a newly minted PhD. And I'm very proud of her because I know her personally and I'm very uh, thrilled that she actually um, she, Anika has had migraine since childhood, but was diagnosed with chronic migraine with aura in 2015 after experiencing a severe migraine for nearly a year. 
Uh, she was just starting her PhD then in epidemiology when her migraine attacks became daily episodes. Trying to manage her condition admits full-time work in school, Anika felt alone as to if no one understood the gravity of what she was suffering through. Learning more about her condition and connecting with others in the migraine community, Anika felt a strong urge to join the movement and advocate for herself and others. She joined her first Miles for Migraine walk run in the fall of 2018 and increased her involvement in the Migraine Patient Education Days and Retreat Migraine, as well as other events. In 2019, she trained with the U.S. Pain Foundation to become a support group leader. Personally understanding the challenges associated with traveling for in-person meetings, in January 2020, Anika worked with us to host and lead the first ever weekly Miles for Migraine National Virtual Support Group. After com just completing her doctoral de degree this past May, She's been able to dedicate more time to pursuing her passion of sharing her journey and experience to increase migraine awareness and provide support to those suffering from migraine and their families. Whether it is migraine or another chronic condition, she wants everyone to know you are not alone. And here is our patient expert, Anika, who's going to speak with us this morning. Um, about 10 things you need to know to make the best, your visit the best with your provider. Thank you, Shirley. And good morning, everyone. Wait, is this the morning? No, it's good afternoon now. Um, maybe morning for those of you who are on the West Coast or a different time zone. Thank you so much for uh, having me here today and allowing me to just share some tips I've used um, as I've gone through some telemedicine visits with my neurologist. And uh, some of these actually Dr. Blumenfeld did mention, so we'll just highlight those and um, reiterate some of these tips. And like Shirley mentioned, we'll take some questions at the end. So I'm going to uh, divide these up into tips that you can um, adopt before your visits, before the visit starts, and things that you can do during your uh, telemedicine visit. So the first thing is we talked about take, keeping a um, journal or knowing your headache pattern. And some of these might be for those who are newer patients or having a new visit. And some of these tips you can use if you're still a returning um, patient. So you wanna know what you're feeling during, before and after an attack, where, you're, where and when the attack occurs and how often. Um, and you wanna keep these in your um, uh, migraine headache diary. And like, the, like Dr. Blumenfeld said, um, you know, it's hard to know how your pattern happens if, I don't know about you, but I have migraine brain and I barely remember anything. So it's really good for me to have these things written down and be able to highlight any changes. Um, you can use an app on your phone, you can use an Excel spreadsheet, but you want to note your symptoms, triggers, warning signs, and very important is any changes in your pattern. So things that you noticed in the last week or two or in the last month or the last time you've seen your doctor, these are really important things. And it's helpful for you to be able to see, is there something that's changing in my environment that could be a contributing factor or anything that's changing um, physiologically? Um, the next thing is gather your medical records. Um, I know when I recently had a um, visit with my neurologist, he asked me something. He's newer. I've seen him for a little bit more than a year, but he asked me a question and I, I had to think, oh man, that was about 10, 15 years ago. And of course, it, these aren't in the records that they have now at my new hospital. So these are things that you kind of want to keep in mind, especially if you're a new patient knowing uh, and being prepared to discuss your full and social history um, before your appointment is very important. And then um, knowing what medications you've taken in the past uh, for your migraine headache, the duration of time that you took them for, um, what's, the, what's the highest dose, um, what were the reasons for discontinuing this medication, these are things that will be helpful for you and for your neurologist or uh, physician uh, provider that you're seeing. Um, and for new patients, you can have a list of all of your medical conditions, any medications you're taking, allergies, past surgeries, um, especially any procedures that you've had on brain, 
your neck or back, also your family history. And you can uh, send all of these things ahead of time to your doctor if um, you have that capability. Um, lastly, before the visit, I want to talk about asking questions ahead of time. So as we just talked about, Dr. Blumenfeld mentioned, the doctors don't always have access to um, the detailed exam that you would have when you're in the, um, in the physician's office. So you can reach out to your doctor or the office and ask them what types of supplies you might need. Um, as he mentioned, there are certain tests that can be done. Um, over the phone. So there may be some tools that they may want you to have um, to be able to conduct those tests. You want to know what to expect, you know. Um, will you have to stand up? Will they need you to stand up, sit down, um, do certain movements? Those are things you might want to know ahead of time so you can prepare for that. And you can ask them about any expectations um, that the doctor might have. And as we mentioned, vital signs. Would they want you to take those vital signs if you have the equipment to do that? Um, another thing to note that I found was helpful is knowing ahead of time how long my visit will be um, virtually, because um, you might there might be a that might be a bad day for you, and the the position that you're in may not be comfortable. But just knowing ahead of time how long you'll have to look at a screen, you know, sometimes that's hard for some of us, or sit in a certain position. Just for me, it's been helpful to know ahead of time how long I can expect my visit to last. And then knowing that information, I can think about, well, um, if it's shorter, then how many questions do I want to have at the end? What are the most important things um, that I want to accomplish or have my doctor know about and discuss during my visit since I have an idea of the time frame? Um, so the next thing we want to talk about is during the visit. So. Um, <laughs> it's important to know like what equipment you're going to use. Are you going to use a cell phone, a tablet, or a laptop? You know, there's many devices. Um, and as we talked about, some of these can be, we want, typically it's uh, visual, they want to see you, but um, what type of app will be used? Is it Skype or is it Zoom or is it, I, uh, what is it, um, FaceTime with iPhones? You know, there's many ways. So have in mind um, the device that you want to use. And then make sure everything is charged. <laughs> make sure you have a full charge. The last thing you want is to run out of battery life and lose your connection. So have a full charge, have everything plugged in. Um, and there was a question that, um, that was asked before we started. And that question was, if your internet isn't always stable, if you live in a certain area where you don't have Wi-Fi, um, how do you manage your telemedicine visit? First, I would say this is a good question to ask ahead of time. Um, one of the things that I found helpful was when I talked to my office, I, um, I asked what are the options? What happens if we get disconnected? And I don't think the answer to that question is universal. It may vary based on the uh, capabilities that you have and the capabilities of your um, provider. So that is a good question to ask ahead of time. But one thing that might be helpful is as soon as the, um, my provider came on, I gave an alternate um, form of communication. So if we were on the computer, I said, hey, here's my phone number in case we get disconnected. So that's something that was helpful to establish that ahead of time. You also want to um, have a backup device. Um, if you're on a laptop, perhaps have it ready to go on your phone if something happens with your computer or vice versa. Um, and some phones do come with uh, mobile hotspots. So if you're having a trouble with your internet, you can pull up the mobile hotspot. So just kind of thinking through these things and knowing um, all the possibilities that could happen and have contingencies in place. Um, the next thing I wanted to note is set your location. So you want to make sure that you're in a quiet place and good lighting. Um, another thing that's helpful is to have, if you can have a solid colored wall, similar to what I have behind me, and when you're looking at a screen, you're trying, uh, your physician and Dr. Blumenthal can confirm this during the q and if, if I'm totally making this up. But um, sometimes when your physician wants to look at you, it's good to have um, a clear view of your face. As he mentioned, seeing eye movements, seeing things when your head turns. So having a, a plain background is helpful. Anything too colorful or box squared and things like that can make it hard to see you clearly. And um, you, you want them to be able to see your face and see any physical problems that might need to be addressed. 
Also with the lighting, try to have the lighting in front of you. Um, if it's behind you, it can form a shadow and it's hard to see you clearly. So think about um, those things as well. Um, we might, <laughs> some people have tried to hold their visit, telemedicine visit uh, while driving, but we're going to encourage you not to do that while you're operating a vehicle. And it's important to remember that this is your private appointment and your scheduled time with your provider. So make sure you're in a private place where you can close the door. Um, and I put the picture of the dog here. Many, many of us have pets, but you wanna make sure they're not interrupting your visit and causing a distraction. So make sure you're, um, no, there's no distract, distractions at all. And if you have any noisy devices, you wanna turn them off in a noisy place. These are things most of us know, but it's, it, it doesn't, sometimes it just seems we can forget those small little nuances. So kind of have it, just remember like, Think about how it is when you actually go into the your physician's or a provider's office. Um, you don't have you, you don't have all of these sounds and noises and pets and children and all of these. Um, so just try to make the most out of your time with your provider. Um, let's see. Oh yes, a couple more. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is come with questions. Um, the things that you know that you you may have come across a new treatment that you'd like to discuss with your provider. Uh, things that um, we talked about the insurance um, being covered, covering your visit. These are things you want to make sure you can ask ahead of time and also have a list of things um, you want to ask. One of the questions we got was about um, your prescriptions. Can that be filled with your uh, while your provider is on the phone? And typically that should not be a problem, but you can ask ahead of time and you can also raise that question with your, uh, your uh, provider while you're on the phone or virtually on the computer. Um, then the next thing I wanted to share is, like I, we mentioned, you're not a, you don't have to do it alone. So some of us have uh, caregivers and it should be perfectly fine for, um, for you to have that person with you because if there's something that needs to be adjusted, if you need help standing up or sitting down, that per, um, person can help you do that. If you're, you're um, having a visit and during the visit, your provider says they, they need you to adjust the lighting or things like that, you can have that person help you. So there's small things that they can do, but again, this is your appointment and make sure that um, you're comfortable with that person there and the same way you would have them if you need assistance while you're in the, um, in the office. So you don't have to do this by yourself. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is just calm your fears. I know telemedicine is new for most patients and can be a little bit unsettling. So ask your doctor to address any questions you might have. If you have concerns about HIPAA or privacy issues, you can address those and make sure that you're okay um, with your visit. Lastly, I would like, I want to say, make sure you have any supplies that you will need to manage your care during your visit. So for example, if you need to have water, if you're having um, your attack intensifies during your visit, have, a, have your medication on hand next to you. Um, these things will just help your visit go a little bit quicker. So lastly, with all of these tips, I hope that they've been helpful and I hope that with this you can have a better visit if you've already had a telemedicine visit or that you will have a good visit if, it's, if you're coming upon one of your first visits. Thanks, uh, Shirley. Thank you, Nika. So we're gonna take a couple questions now from the audience and uh, I, I did put into the chat just now that we can for, unfortunately cannot take any uh, treatment questions that are specific to treatment today. If you would like to come to our next education day, I put the link in the chat box where Dr. Deb Friedman will present a treatment update. There she will be discussing every medicine currently being offered for migraine new and old and what's in the pipeline. Uh, but let's go shift back to telemedicine here today. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Blumenfeld about, uh, is there anything that you wish patients would do, would not do on a telemedicine appointment? Well, certainly um, it's good to have a quiet environment where you can concentrate on the visit so that it, you know, it feels like it's just the two of us. If it's a, if it's a noisy area, that's very uh, distracting. 
um, and it's hard for both of us to concentrate. So I think that's the most important uh, for me. I do like patients to be somewhat prepared. And I think we've, we've covered the main things, you know, where the diary would help um, set them up nicely for the questions we're going to ask. I think um, it's also important to have qu questions that the patient has thought about before the visit to focus the discussion and make sure that all those concerns are being heard. Um, you know, I think the most important thing in, in thinking about management of chronic migraine is that it is a, it's a long-term process and you, you try different medicines along this process to, to get people better. And there's no set plan. It's, it varies depending on the individual. And some patients will want to try many different medications, layering many different medicines on top of each other in order to get as close to control of their headaches as possible. Whereas others may want to just do a, a much more limited uh, group of medicines to, to help with their situation. But we don't know all these details up front. So I need those questions to come from the patient that kind of guide me to where you would like me to take you. Um, from my perspective, I always explain to patients that this is a, is a long path that they're walking down and that there'll be ups and downs on this path. We'll, we might hit some good medicines, some bad ones, uh, but we need to keep working you know, together and we can't do this quickly. I think that there, there needs to be a realization that there's no quick fix and it takes time to try things and, and work through the process. So you do have to have this sort of long-term relationship with your provider that that you're trying to set up and, and and you use these visits to develop that relationship. I've actually found the televisit to be a very personal exchange. It, um, it, it's somewhat different to the in-office visit. Some of the formality goes away and it becomes much more of a friendly discussion. Um, so uh, from that perspective, I, th you know, I think there's a lot of advantages to, to think about. We haven't fully worked them all out yet, but I think you know, most of us think of, of phone calls and even this type of interaction over with, with video. It's, it's a very personal experience. Absolutely, and somebody put into the chat question, what if you're immunocompromised uh, I guess this would be a great opportunity for someone if they're immunocompromised. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's really the perfect uh, setup uh, in the current environment. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it's bringing lots of other advantages that we never thought about. What if a patient has more than the 10 minute or 15 minute, however long the appointment generally is, has more questions that can't be answered in that time allotted for, what should that patient do? Well, this is the thing. It's very easy for us to set up another visit, um, another televisit if that was the case. But what typically happens is we'll, we'll go over. The telemedicine coding allows you to code by time. So I don't think the patient has to be too concerned that they are using up a lot of time. Our schedules are not as busy during COVID as they were before. Before we were in the office running from room to room. Now um, things have, uh, have opened up. You know, a lot of patients um, are not coming in. A lot of new patients we're not seeing. The primary care doctors are not sending them to us. Um, you know, I'm not sure why that's happened, but there has been a drop-off. Um, we have a drop-off in our procedures too. Our patients are anxious and they're not coming in. So we have a lot of more time than we ever did. And um, because the codes allow you to build according to time, I don't think it's an issue at all. I think, um, you know, worst case, you'd have to set up another visit, uh, but most of the time it should just continue on. 
Okay, this is a general question. So I probably, it, let's just apply it to your office. If somebody gets logged off and they can't get back on, do they wait back in line to get in to see the same day? I, I guess this is really a question just for your office specifically. I'm assuming it's well, different. Certainly, yeah, office. so certainly they don't get back in line and have right. to wait to, to come back in because we're in the middle of the visit. So we need to complete the visit. And what I would typically do, because this has happened, we've lost internet connection. It could be on our side. It could be on the patient side. You know, with everybody using the internet so much these days, it, it does seem to get overwhelmed. But we will just then at that point do a phone visit and I'll just say to the patient, I'm, I'm gonna call you and um, pick up the phone and call them on their cell. So we would have had the video connection in the beginning and I feel that that's adequate, you know, that I'm, I, I can now go ahead and complete all the questions that I need to you know, finish the discussion by phone. Um, now, if you don't have a phone connection, then you're in problems. We're going to have to try and get back to you later that day. Um, but it would typically be our office that would be calling you to finish the visit because it, it, the onus is on us to complete the visit. Well, you mentioned something interesting before, and that was that you need to see the patient to be considered a telemed visit. What if they don't have an internet connection it needs to be by phone i know my own experience was i actually did it with just my telephone i didn't actually yeah. see my doctor so, so you can do a phone visit without the video um, there are separate codes for that so the, mm -hmm. the 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 telemedicine system does allow for that it's just a different method of coding and this is all in its infancy in terms of how these insurance companies are going to work through this process. I agree with you that if we could just do the majority of them by phone, to a large extent, that would be fine. You know, maybe it's the new patient that needs to have the video so that you can do the brief exam. It is nice to see the person and to be able to communicate, you know, face to face. Um, but the alternative of the phone is not a bad one. And and that way you're pretty sure you're gonna get hold of everybody. I would think, I guess in a rural situation or perhaps an elderly patient that doesn't have ex uh, exposure to the camera, then perhaps that would be an option for them. Yes. Yeah, so if a patient needs prescriptions filled at the time of the visit, are you normally generally doing that as well? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, this is all done electronically today. So that's very easy. Um, you know, we can send your prescriptions directly to the pharmacy at the same time as, the, as we're talking to you. Um, we can email you the notes so that you can see the details of the visit and you don't have to write down anything. So we can use a lot of the electronic setups that are now available to us to make this a, a much better, more efficient process mm -hmm. than ever before would. Um, you know, we, we don't have to, to print things. So we just hit a button and send you an email. Um, so I like it a lot. Now, these are some other questions that were, um, we received in the, in the pre-survey that we sent out to uh, during registration. Uh, will my te telemedicine appointment be with my doctor or will I see a doctor that is not familiar with me in my case? I'm specifically, I guess this is just going to have to apply to your office because this seems like it could yes, be sir. in every in office. In our office, it would definitely be with your provider. There'd be no reason to do it with a different provider and, and unless there was some emergency situation and your provider was not available, um, it, it would definitely be linked to your provider. Mm -hmm. So could you just, in general, uh, just walk us through the process of when the patient calls your office, because I'm assuming, again, this is different in every office, schedules the appointment, then what happens next? How do they get the link or what, what does your office do specifically to get people on the line with you? So the patient does have to log on to a website and register so that they can then be entered into the visit. And they go through a check-in process exactly the same as if they were at the front desk checking in. 
So they basically arrive in a, in a, in a virtual room where they have to check in and show their insurance card and take care of any uh, you know, co-pays and all of the typical things that you would do at the time you check in. And then they would have an interaction with the nurse who would be entering their medications and opening up their visit for me. And, and then I will get a notification on my phone that the patient is ready for me. Um, so I, I then have, to, if I'm doing something else, I have this message that says, you know, you need to, to move and get to the next patient. And uh, so then I'll connect with the patient um, so that you may be on a hold while you're waiting for me to come um, basically into your room and see you, which is, I'm just going to log on and, and, and then both of us will be visible on a screen as we have this uh, discussion. Um, and I'll have to be typing while I'm talking. So, you know, my, I'll be entering my notes, um, but I'll be talking into the phone at the same time. And um, we'll go through the visit in the usual way, do the prescriptions, do all the instructions. Um, we have your email on file, and then I'll send you the note. Um, and, we'll, and we'll set up our plans for the next visit. A lot of times, you know, let's say you were a new patient and I walked you through um, different treatments and you picked a treatment, we'd call that in, we'd have a follow-up visit um, to see how you're doing. You know, eventually you might need a procedure visit and that's when I would do your examination. So the, the procedure visit actually has a lot of value there because I now get a chance to see you and uh, do two things at once, make sure that I'm on the right track. Um, so that, that's how, how it's been set up. There's this intermingling between procedures and televisits. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense if you can come in to the, just for the procedure and limit your exposure if you are immunocompromised or if you know this is a trigger for you, you can come in, get your procedure, and then in six weeks time, see your provider through a telemed visit. It just seems so much easier and more reasonable. I don't know why we had to wait this long to get it. I, I know, it's, it's, <laughs> a, it's, it, it's a good thing that's happened out of all the negative. And um, you know that follow-up visit that, that insurance companies require after you've been started on treatment like Botox, that's a quick and easy visit. And why come in and waste so many hours? That can be done on the phone. Uh, you know, right. things like the, the copay uh, plans that these uh, companies have, like Allegan has a copay plan uh, for their Botox procedure that um, makes it very easy to get reimbursed if you're coming in and get your copay taken care of. Um, the savings cards that, these, uh, that most of the new drugs have is also something, you know, that you want to make sure you have access to. Now, typically we've handed those out during the visit, you know, the in-person visit, but if you, you're having a televisit and you want to get those copay cards, the, the savings cards, then you can uh, just go online to that company and typically you'll be able to print them out. I, I think they're important to be aware about because they can save you a lot of money. And again, during this era where money is you're not, not as easy to come by as it was before, um, it's an important aspect of your treatment. Um, just about all the new drugs have these savings cards, uh, and Allegan does a, a, save, a copay uh, plan for any of the procedures that uh, covers most of the cost uh, out of pocket. Right, and I put that link in the chat in case anyone's interested. You can just click on that link, go to our website, and take a look at these uh, savings cards that are being offered. Well, we're out of time, and I just want to mention, uh, we did have one last question here. What can we do to support the continued use of telemedicine and migraine? The answer is that we will continue to advocate, and we really, I can't stress this enough, how important it is for all of us here today. We all have to do our part, and if it's something that's hard for you because you are debilitated, please consider enlisting a family member, another caregiver, someone that you work with, whoever it is, we really need to start speaking more about our experience with migraine, how it affects us. And you can learn to do that 
by coming to our education events and our support groups. And we hope that you will answer the surveys, the two surveys that will come to you uh, as a follow-up to this important program. And I wanna thank again our presenters for being here today on a Saturday morning when you could be doing something else. So Dr. Andrew Blumenfeld and Dr. Anika, new Dr. Anika Salim, uh, I'm very grateful that you are here today and I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thank you, Shirley. Bye. Thank you, Shirley. Bye-bye.